Are we? All right. This is a backup. I'm doing audio for backup. Right. Um, who are you, and how did you uh, how did you get involved with JUnit? Well, uh, my name is Kent Beck, and uh, let's see. So uh, uh, let me tell you how I got involved in testing, because okay. testing wasn't in in my frame of reference for a long time. When I was in school, the people who got A's and B's in computer science courses got to be programmers, and the people who got C's got to be testers. And I was really clear one of my good friends was a tester, and I was definitely higher status than him. So clearly, I did not want to write tests. So um, when I came out, I started writing programming in Smalltalk. And um, Smalltalk had kind of this West Coast, hot tubby, zen kind of culture where tests would be uh, an impediment to your oneness with your program. And I've talked to, to small talkers about, about writing, like really, the Xerox Park kind of small talkers about writing tests and so just like, why would I separate myself from my program like that? Which is kind of bizarre. Um, so I was out probably six or seven years, and I worked at a startup called MassPar, and we had two compiler teams. One team was building the Fortran compiler, which granted is Fortran 90 is a pretty complicated language, but that was six or eight people. And then there was a guy writing a C compiler for this parallel machine, and it was one person, Christopher Glazer. And Christopher was faster, more creative, lower stress, um, did created more value. He was relaxed in a way that the Fortran guys weren't. And the secret of his success, according to him, was that he wrote five lines of test code for every line of compiler he wrote. And the first time I heard that, I thought, you know, what a waste. You, you know, you're wasting 80% of your development time, whatever it works out to. And, and, you know, he didn't care. But every night he'd run tons and tons of tests, so he'd make some changes to the compiler. And it was, you know, optimizing compiler, did all kinds of crazy stuff, but he was able to outperform, from my perspective, this, this whole team of very smart people. And tests were the real key to that. So I started writing, um, I had dabbled with various ways of writing automated tests. Uh, in small talk and hadn't hit on one that I really liked and I was about to go to a client um, in Chicago and I knew that I wanted to tell them to write automated tests because it was starting up this new project and they kind of were looking for advice this is way before XP maybe 94 um, and I, but I didn't have any way for them to write tests. So I thought, well, you know, I'd done several things that didn't work very well, but I thought, well, let me think about this. So in, in small talk, a common way to work is you'd have a workspace. A workspace was just a bunch of expressions that you'd, You'd type in because you wanted something like this to produce some value. And you'd select some stuff and you'd say print it. Now we'd come to number five. And you'd say, okay, yeah, that's good. And then you'd copy this and paste it down there. And then you'd edit some stuff and then you'd say print it. And then you'd keep programming until it printed out seven, which is the number that you expected. But uh, well, what's the naive, wh what would be the naive object model? What's the object? obvious object model, if I just translate it from this style of programming into objects. So the whole workspace became a suite. The, the, uh, each one of the, the little expressions that you executed became a, a, an instance of test case. And something I noticed is that the setup code the code to create the objects was oftentimes common. So each one of those would become a test case class. It's just 
to me, was the, the obvious, naive translation from that. And so I programmed for an hour or so and had to add a test result, which sort of gathered up the results of running all of these suites and then reported everything. And then instead of printing out actual numbers, um, the, I had methods called should and should, which said what then you need to say. This expression should be true. This other expression should be false. And so in, in three classes and 12 methods, I had the, the basics of, of testing. So I took that to the client and I said, you know, here, here's how you write tests. And they said, oh, okay, we can do that. Yeah, that's fine. You know, I have a little example. Okay, good. We didn't know you could write tests like that. I said, oh, sure. Yeah, so you know, okay, fine. So they started writing tests and seemed to like it, but I was still was so small. This is just not interesting. So I, I took it and I sent it to Hal Hildebrand, who's one of the smartest programmers that I know. And I figured, you kind of the, the hey Mikey, if Hal likes this, it's got to be good because it's just too simple to be to be good. So nothing came back, no words came back from me. He was working on a really complicated object database where it's a persistent small talk. It was really cool. Did all kinds of nasty, low-level tricks. So about six weeks passed by, and I thought, okay, well, my client says they're using it, but who knows? And Hal didn't say anything, so whatever. So then I get this email. I said, this is great. Uh, what? Great? He said, yeah. So he had this object database, and so it has a very high-level API that was really nice. And it just wasn't working. And down at the bottom, he said, I, he had bugs and he, he couldn't figure them out because when you have a bug in, in a really low level code, it just crashes the system. So the debugger doesn't help you. All the money or tools help you anymore. So he said he, he would start, he got frustrated. He couldn't debug this thing and he would just write tests for his lowest level data structures. And, you know, couldn't possibly help, but he would do it. So he wrote, you know, just for the really stupid stuff that you couldn't possibly make mistakes with. And he found bugs. And so he tested the very lowest layer of all of his objects, and he found a bunch of bugs, and he fixed them, and the whole system just plain started running. And I'm like, oh, there's something. This is, this is definitely cool. So I started um, talking about it more at conferences, um, gave away a version of that to people in the small talk world. And then um, at some point, fairly early on in that, I remembered a book that I'd read as a kid. I used to, my dad would bring home computer books and I would just read them cover to cover. And I didn't understand the work, you know, the Burroughs 6700 instruction set manual and the artificial intelligence and whatever. Just, I would read them, all the words would pass into my head with no particular understanding. And I remembered this book that said, here's how you write an application. You take the input tape, the sample input tape, and you manually type in the output tape that you expect to get from that. And then you program until you get the output tape that you typed in. That's how you do it. And I thought, this is a really stupid idea. Why would I write a test that isn't going to work? Right? My goal is to have the tests that work. So this is a really stupid idea, so I'll try. And so that's when I started doing test first. Test first is an old, old, you know, it's a 50-year-old idea. And I tell people who were in programming a long time ago about it, and they say, sure, that's what we always did. When did you guys forget? So, um, I just started it and it was, it was just writing automated tests was, was a liberating, freeing, stress reducing, confidence building kind of thing. And test first was that whole thing double tripled. Just because I, yeah, I always knew what to do next. If I had a failing test, I make it work. If I don't have a failing test, I write a test that fails. If I can't think of a test that fails and I can't think of how to clean up the code, then I'm done. 
So it never felt done before, but the tests really helped with that. So about 97, um, Eric Gamma and I were flying to Uppsala. I'm getting to the J part now. Um, we were flying to Uppsala from Switzerland, and um, I, yeah, and I, uh, I wanted to learn Java because it was obvious that small talk was as a commercial vehicle was on the way down, and then Java was on the way up as a commercial vehicle. So and he'd been doing a bunch of Java stuff. So I said, okay, well, let's teach me Java. Um, and so we sat down on this airplane, and I said, well, what you know, well, what program should we write? So we talked a little bit. And I said, well, I got this stupid little testing framework. It's minuscule, but it's kind of cool uh, if we do that. It's um, actually bef a little bit before then, I'd been going to a conference um, in Erfurt, in Germany, on the train, and I realized I had, didn't have a copy of my, the testing framework with me. So I thought, oh, I have to, I'll whip it up from scratch. But you know, just to be really computer science y, I'm going to do a test first, which is doing a writing a testing framework test first, where using it to to verify its own workings is tricky. So it's cool. <laughs> so I had done that. So I, when we were going to go do this thing in, in Java, I thought, let's we'll, we can do the same thing B because the code came out cleaner, right? I, this three class twelve method thing was simpler and cleaner done tests first. So um, we're flying and we start start adding the tests and making them work and adding tests and making them work and, and we're giving each other high fives and just it was so much fun to, to do this and uh, we're making a little bit of noise and, and there was a, um, a guy in, in kind of a low-priced brown suit sitting across the aisle, and we flew into Dulles. And he's giving us that boy, you know, what are you guys doing? So, no, whatever, you know, we're just having fun. So we get to, we get to Dulles, and he goes to the, to the customs, whatever, goes up to the front of the customs line, splashes a badge, and walks right through. And we're thinking, oh, well. we just spent, you know, seven hours annoying a federal agent. That's got to not be a great move, so yeah, nothing ever came of that. But. So we, um, we had Jay, and the first person we gave it to was Martin Fowler. Because again, it just looked too small, simple, whatever, it couldn't possibly be interesting. How did you decide to give it to Martin? Because I worked with Martin at um, the C3 project, and um, he'd done, uh, I knew he'd done stuff with the Smalltalk version, which eventually was called this unit. Um, didn't have a name for a long time. Uh, so I knew that he sort of appreciated that. I knew that he'd been doing work in Java. So he see, and, and he was a friend, so it was, he was a natural person for me to have a couple of. So we gave it to him and to a few other people there. And people started writing tests there at the conference. And we started getting good feedback. And s since... Um, the world says you can't make money with valuable software anymore. We just gave it away. It's not really open source. JUnit is not open source in the sense that most people understand that. Eric and I are the only people who've ever touched the code. We get submissions, but we've always rewritten every submission we've got. So it's it's free software. It doesn't make us any money, but it's not really an open source project. So that was the genesis of JMO. It was a translation of the small talk thing that I'd done. And we did it as a learning exercise for me for Java. And then Eric coined the term test infected. Because after that, just the feeling of having tests as a, as a safety net is totally different than when you know. It's just night and day. Emotional, the emotional experience of programming is completely different. So he coined that term test infected talk about how he had changed in doing that. Uh, how did you decide to make it more widely available? Couldn't think of how to make any money off of it. Is that a fair 
there was no there was no way to market it. People would pay, people wouldn't pay for it at that time okay. in history. So that's the way not that's that's a reason not to charge money for it. But what what was your reason for wanting to make it available to anyone at all, other than yourself? It's just so cool. Okay. Yeah, and and I mean, I, it's, it sounds like you're fishing for a, a deeply altruistic answer, and I don't think I really have one. No, but whatever, okay. whatever answers, because it was yours and for your purpose, and then. I didn't. I didn't hear the thinking that went into my purpose. You know, here. Was, I can't sell it, so I might as well give it away. That was really. Yeah. You know, I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, and, and really, you can't make money. Okay. Little software tools anymore. So. Because I have stuff that I can't sell, and it's just in my office. <laughs> so that's it. But so selfish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, except it, except it's not. It's more just clueless instead of courage. I just can't. I mean, yeah. it's the same thing that lets them talk in front of three thousand people, right? Yeah. I mean, some people say, "Oh, that's an act of courage," but it's not because I'm not afraid. Right. It's just like, well, duh. Yeah. Um, when you made it available, who, who did you? Who were you thinking of? Who, who did you imagine would use it, or did you hope would use it? Programmers. Always from the very beginning, as soon as we, s the, 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 the very beginning was just, let's do this cool thing, and doing it test first, and really trying to have a clean, clean, clean design was, was paramount. But very soon thereafter, the, the goal was, hey, um, there's all these testing tools out there at that point. There were lots and lots of testing tools available. And people would come up with special scripting languages for tests, and programmers didn't want to use them because it's this whole other set of tools. So from very early in its life, JNet was directed at programmers writing tests for their own purposes to improve their own work experience, their own uh, both the emo emotional experience of programming, but but the the concrete results too. Um, what what design choices did you make, and how did you make those? Either before you were originally made it available, or afterwards, as you saw how people were using. It. What were the design choices, and how did you? Well, the big one is to use um, use Java as the scripting language, and uh, that was a controversial choice at the time. I don't think that I'd seen other people do that. It's not an ideal fit for testing a language for expressing tests. But, you know, the programmers already know it, so there's a really low barrier to entry. The, one of the, the design points of JUnit is trying to reduce the barrier to entry for writing your first test. It's just got to be so simple that, that you don't have any... Th there aren't technical excuses for not doing it. And so the, that's the, the biggest one is, is to use um, Java as the test scripting language. Um, for JUnit, uh, until the, this latest release, JUnit 4 is pretty substantial re-architecture, but until then, um, having a common superclass. It's, it's limiting, and I wish that I didn't have to do it, but until recently, I didn't know how not to. So um, having a common superclass for, uh, for tests. There's kind of a, this odd, twisty, um, the test case class represents one thing, and an instance of that class represents something else. Yeah, so the test case class really represents this fixture, this common fixturing code that builds some objects. And then right next to that are these methods that look, you know, they're just methods in the same class, but, but this one runs with one of these, but not more than one of those test methods. That was a kind of a weird design choice, and I wish that I'd had a, I'd been able to do something else with that because it trips people up. But... Um, 
that was a choice. It, it's, it's a compression. Now, Eric and I have a, a paper, the Cook's Tour of J unit, that talks about the kind of one pattern at a time, how do you get to the J unit architecture? You know, each test case is a command object. And, 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 and. So um, it talks about, about how you get there as a kind of a way of, of avoiding having tons and tons of little weensy weensy classes. Because you could have, and you can still implement it with a, uh, one test case per class. But it's just, you, you know, it's, a test case is not worth that. Classes are expensive and in, in my internal metrics, and so I want to avoid that. So you could have multiple test cases in a single class, except they run in separate instances. Some of the X unit implementations don't follow that pattern, and I think that they're making a mistake because. Um, one of my experiences at MassPar was I wrote a GUI tester in Smalltalk and I did everything I could to make a really good GUI tester. And the tests were still extremely fragile and one of the modes of fragility is I would come in and there would be a stack of defect reports on my chair because one test case had failed and messed up a bunch of other test cases. So um, test case isolation is an extremely important principle in, in j -Man. The goal is for the success or failure of a single test to have no possible impact on the success or failure of other tests. People can still mess that up. You can use statics. And, and what are, if you share state between tests, you have to work hard not to, to keep them isolated. But if you just use fields, um, each test runs completely independently and I think that's a feature not a bug because the, that jackpot behavior where you get this big stack of failures is, you know, you, I'd get the first five times it happened I'd have this adrenaline rush, oh I must have messed up a bunch of stuff and then I thought, oh, uh, you know, so um, it's, uh, it was just such a, you, and then you have this big letdown and you, after a while it's like, you just ignore it. Oh, there's a stack of pages and whatever that happens all the time. So it was very important to me to have my tests be isolated. So test isolation is built in real deep to JUnit. But that's also not something that uh, everyone shares as a goal. Um, and then another design choice is the suite. Suites as composites of test cases, which is actually is something we're getting rid of in JUnit 4 because it causes lots of problems for the people who write test runners. Conceptually, if you understand composite and I say suites of composite of test cases, you just go, oh, yes, of course. But it turns out that because, you, you know, if you've got this big long tree, for example, if you want to rerun one of the test cases at the leaf, you have to carefully go through all the ancestors in the tree and run everything that they could have run before, run this one test case, and then go back up <coughs> and run everything that they could have run afterwards. And to do that really properly um, is a lot of work. And so we just thought that's not, it's not worth it. So what are you doing now instead of JUnit 4? Uh, we're not quite sure yet. Currently, you, you send a collection of, of test case classes. It's likely that we'll have some kind of a, a, a flat collection of some kind of factories that generate each of which would generate one or more individual test cases. But that's not set yet. Um, what? surprised you about people's reaction to JUnit? Well, the initial reaction that, that they, people, you know, just said, oh, this is wonderful, you know, that, uh, I love programming like this, um, that was a big surprise. That something so small would have so much impact. Um, something else that surprised me is how easily people fall off the wagon. They'll write a bunch of tests. They'll say, this is great. I love it. And you go back a month later, and the tests don't even compile. Nobody's running them in a month. Yeah, but you really, you like having all the tests working. 
yeah, 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 but, but uh, we got all these bugs. We can't have the test failing all the time. We got all these bugs to fix. Right? It's one of those where you just, how can you screw your head around to say that in a sentence? But people do. Um, what well, other surprises? Uh, how hard it has been to, to create a business model around it. I figured there would be some way of making good money out of it, and I just haven't found it. So that was a surprise. Um, the clones, all the clones, was a big surprise. So I helped on the very early stages of the of N unit, the C sharp version. I helped um, on the early stages of of the Python one. But the, the fact that the architecture spread so far has been a big surprise to me. Um, how about how people are using it? What surprised you about how people are using it? Mostly just how badly done it is. And for something that people know would help, maybe it's like flossing. Right? It's, yeah, it's something that's clearly helpful and then people just don't do it. Me included. Plus, testing I mostly do. So, um, that's part of it. Um, another thing that's really surprising is the, the conventional wisdom was that people, that programmers can't test their own code. Right? Well, the fact is that programmers just didn't test their own code. Nobody knew whether they could or not because it had just been CW for so long. So, um, one big surprise is just how few defects teams can have that are serious about the developers testing their own code. And, and it, it's not uncommon, it's not, it's not the majority yet, but it's, it's fairly common for me to hear about people who have no defects in production or to have you know, one defect a month or one defect a year. And, and that kind of, f it flies in the face of the, the conventional wisdom. It's not to say that there's not a place for professional testers. I think there is a place for professional testers on, on teams, and I'm not just saying that to kiss up. Um, but it is possible for programmers to write epsilon defect code. And in a complicated environment, there's going to be nasty uh, for all the problems that they know happen. Right? And I think my experience of programming without tests was I'd have lots of defects and I'd kind of go, yeah, I kind of knew something wasn't right there. And that can just go away with applying the test. That was a big surprise to me. Um, looking back, is there anything that you wish you had done differently or you would do differently if you were? starting without a zillion people already using the thing? Hmm. Not really. You talked a little bit about the, the future. Some questions you still haven't answered yet. What, can you say more about where you see the future of JU? Well, um, Eric and I are in the, somewhere in the middle of JUnit 4. Um, I think we're going to have to cut back the scope uh, on it to, to get the first release out, but um, the architecture is simplified yet again. Um, we use the Java 1.5 features um, to make, to, to instead of, so a, a way of looking at a, a, the conventions in JUnit where you have to name a, a method TEST something or other and you have to descend from test case <coughs> is that's a kind of metadata. It's a kind of annotation. It's just done by convention and your programming tools can't help you very much with it. So JUnit 4 makes full use of the, of the Java 1.5 annotation features, which was an architecture that was pioneered by the NUnit guys. I saw that two years ago and I thought, this is really well done, really a nice piece of design. So we, we copied that um, pretty wholesale without copying all of their philosophy. But so 
it's a simplification. Tests, writing tests is now simpler than it was because you don't have to descend from any particular class. Um, uh, you know, you annotate a method with before and it gets executed before the tests. You annotate a method with test and it gets executed as a test. If you have multiples of those, you create multiple instances and execute, you know, one per test. Um, and uh, that's, so th that part of it is pretty much running. The part of it that's, that's more up in the air is, is what's the best architecture for specifying suites of tests. If you don't have this composite structure at runtime, what's a, a good declarative structure that can be shared between the various tools in an IDE running the same tests in AND? So we don't like having a separate um, configuration file that define tests. We'd like to do it somehow in the source code, whether it's with annotations or with Javadoc or with I don't know what. Um, some way of specifying suites, test filtering, and so on that's, that's relatively straightforward to implement and that's portable. And we just don't have that yet. So, but the current one is is fully forwards and backwards compatible. So you can run new JUnit tests with the old JUnit runners and old JUnit tests with the current small um, JUnit runner. Um, I have a longer term project to track usage of JUnit. So every time you hit run, it notes that fact with some central server. So you can have statistics, your own personal statistics of how often do you run, and how long are your tests, and how often do they fail, and, and whatever. But you can also, I mean, the vision is to be able to compare that with global norms. So you know, the, the vision is to have 100,000 programmers all running tests, they're all getting reported with this to this central database, and then you could track trends in testing, and eventually even record um, results from different languages. So you could compare and contrast results how to Python users test versus how to Java users test and so on. That's kind of pie in the sky. I, mean, I have prototypes, but I don't have any, any funding or business plan or anything like that. Currently, it's just kind of cool, geeky stuff. Um, and the other big trend that I see is the commercialization of it. Um, companies like Agitar, who uh, employ me part-time, is, are building tools that are only possible because developers are writing tests. And I expect to see other, other vendors, commercial vendors like that emerge. Oh, another big surprise, you asked about surprises. Another big surprise was the emergence of all of the JUnit um, add-on projects. Uh, there's 20 or 30 that take JUnit into a little bit different direction. And um, Eric and I are very minimalist in our design, that the framework should be the intersection of features, not the union of features. So I think that it's a compliment when someone says to me, Kent, you're so stupid, why didn't you just add this little thing to JUnit, because then my tests are really easy to write. Right, thank you. <laughs> and then somebody else says, you know, you're so stupid, why didn't you just add this other thing, which is contradictory, because then my tests are so easy to write. Well, lots of people have done that. I don't think we've done a very good job of engaging in that community, though, and that's something I want to work on, is making sure that those people have a, people with the add-ons have a, a clear path forward to the architecture. But they understand that you're doing that on purpose, not to thwart their efforts or whatever. Oh, I'm, I don't care whether they, okay. whether they get that or not. I, I don't let that swing. Um, what else should I be asking you? Seems like it's about it. Maybe the, the the only thing I can think of is about the, the transformation of the act of programming. I think there's something quite fundamental going on 
both at an individual level, me interacting with my computer. Yeah, yeah, this is. I had to say there was nothing else before I could actually say what else. That's, that's okay. Um, part, part of it is just me interacting with my computer and, and how is that different intellectually and emotionally than it used to be. And um, I think that that's the, for me, just for me personally, that's one of the, the purposes of developer testing. That it makes programming more fun. My design is better. I have lower stress. Higher productivity. I'm more creative. I take bigger chances. Um, and then at a, at a social level, developer testing to me is about accountability and saying, here's what I was thinking. Each test is a, is a record of a thing I thought about while I was programming. The things that I was willing to write down, the things that I'm willing to commit to, that I'm willing to be accountable to, to the rest of my team, to my customers. I say, yeah, I thought through this scenario and I think it works. And if somebody, some, I mean, it opens me up. Somebody can come along and say, here's this other important scenario and it's clearly not listed in your test. And I have to be prepared to say, yep, you're right, I didn't think of that. You know, and it could be, I didn't think about it because I didn't know that. Or I didn't think about it, you told me and I blew you off. But, but the tests make a very clear record of my thinking. And I, um, sometimes I'm really comfortable with that and sometimes I'm not. But my, my output, my contribution to a team is always better if I offer that accountability to other people. And to me, that's where developer testing plays into bigger trends in software development is I think there's a big trend towards accountability, visibility, commitment, integrity, and the people who are able to deliver that get the programming jobs now in a way that, that for a long time programmers kind of had to get out of jail free card from the usual social contract. And developer testing is a thing developers can do to work with that trend to make it to to make it work for them instead of um, you know, tearing jobs out of their poor trembling fingers and send them overseas. It's a way of saying, no, you know, I can be more accountable in my work. I'm willing to say exactly what I was thinking in a, in a concrete way. And if the bar ever goes red, it's, you know, I made a mistake. Flat out. Maybe the test is wrong, maybe the code is wrong, but I made a mistake. And I'm willing to be accountable for that. I think that gives programmers a way to play into that big, large scale trend towards accountability. And so I think it's, there's, a, there's kind of a, I was going to use the word liberation. There's, a, there's an opportunity there, not to overstate the case. There's an opportunity there for people to, to work with the big trends in software development instead of working against them. You're touching on something that I remembered that I wanted to ask. And uh, is there something that you're seeing, or what is it about sort of the, the moment when, when it was released and it started? What is it that made it catch on? Do you have ideas about that? I have their, they seem kind of arrogant to me. Okay. But I think people have been saying test, 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 test in a kind of blaming, shaming way. You know, you, if you were a good programmer, you'd be writing tests. You know that, don't you? And I think that programmers would say, yeah, but, yeah, but you talk to me like that and forget it. I'm not going to do it. Um, so I think that what made, a big part of what made JUnit catch on is that Eric and I both had strong technical reputations. And we didn't try to stuff it down anybody's throat. We didn't say, you know, you really ought to test. We said, hey, we started writing tests and as much as we loved programming before, we love programming better. As, as good as our designs were before, our designs are better. So, you know, and, and, and you have fewer defects and you're trustworthy and that feels you sold it as programming is fun again. Yeah. Our programming is more fun. 
Yeah, we programming have fun is writing this program. We all have fun using it. Right, because we tell that creation story. You know, every idea that catches on has a creation story. And it's really, you know, if you don't have one, it's not going to catch on. So that st I don't know how many times I've told that story about the airplane and high fives and the guy with the brown suit. But, you know, people could hook into that and they say, well, that, th and this is my theory. People would say, okay, well, if, if Eric will do it, if Kent will do it, then I, you know, it's not beneath me. Whether that's really true or not. But I, th I think that was a big part of it, was just that it came, it came out of the programming culture. It was a contribution to the programming culture. It had nothing to do with people, with those people, right, who blame and, and tell you you're doing a bad job. It's just like, here's something that made my experience of programming better. And it's so simple. Right, and, and then it, did, it helped that there was, there's a little bit of cleverness, I think, in the framework, in the kind of this, okay, I'll let me go figure out how this all works. Okay, okay, it's cool. Right, so yeah, I can, I can use a tool, you know, if it uses reflection, yeah, okay, you know, tool to use, and composite, reflection and composite, you know, and then there's, there's seven design patterns in three classes. Okay, yeah, here yeah, we, I think there was a certain sense of that, you know, like a, like auto buyers, right? There's a there's a kind of high end of the auto buying market, and and just the fact that it's a V12 with four valves per cylinder, you know, the performance of the car might be absolutely the same as something else, but just it's got that edge to it. It's cool, and so people will will dive into it, and I, and I think that that drove a lot of it, but. I don't think that developer testing has gone very far compared to how its potential because lots of people don't write tests who could you know technically and they have more they have time to do it um, uh, because they have plenty of time to debug um, that the tests that people write are really quite ineffective um, for a large measure I mean, working with Agitar, we go see people on their JUnit tests, and lots of them are a mess. And even though they spend a lot of energy on them, they're still a mess. So there's a there's still a big opportunity to get a lot more juice out of developer testing for that to create a lot more value. So I mean, that's someplace I think it's, it could go. It could just become kind of this queen. Who who. Kind of thing, but it could also, you know, uh, could become as indispensable as a compiler. Yes, of course you do. Anything else you want to say? You didn't say what you thought the role of a tester was. You didn't say what you thought testers could be doing. Yeah, so, so when programmers start writing tests, testers get nervous. What do I have to do in this new world? And I mean, it seems like a natural concern. Um, <coughs> the role I see for testers on a project is as a when I when I was a kid back in the olden days, testers were kind of adult supervision, right? After the programmers did their whatever you know Animal House frat party thing, and the testers would come along and say, you guys have to clean up your room. Which, you know, is demeaning to everybody and doesn't work very well. Um, I see the role of testers, so let's, let's posit that developers are writing lots of tests. And they don't make stupid mistakes anymore. They don't make avoidable mistakes. They don't have code not work that they go, oh yeah, that really should work, but eh. So now if the defect rate is one one hundredth what it used to be, what does the tester do? I think that the testers then, because the programmers are being trustworthy, the testers don't have to prov to like bolt trust onto the process. They can move their efforts more upstream to act as communication amplifiers between the people with desires and the the programmers who are going to try and realize those desires. Um, 
it requires a different skill set, a little bit different skill set. It's not the, this black hat. I kind of swallow the the black hat mythology. You know, the testers. You give me your code and I'll break it. Kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, with the eyebrows. Um, and um, somebody really called me on the carpet for that, and I realized, yeah, that's not. I don't think that's the best mutually, the most mutually beneficial relationship there. People with a skill for breaking software, for, for finding holes in logic, for spotting, for reading in between the lines and spotting the gaps, there's no particular reason they have to do that after the software is finished. So by moving those activities up before development, just before development is the best place I know to do it. They have a, they're acting then as, as an amplifier for the communication. The customer says, I want a report like this. And they said, okay, well, here's a, you know, you said these things, but here's some stuff you didn't say. Is there something you want to say about what happens when there's more than a page full of blah, blah, blah? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. But uh, that never happens, or do this, or whatever it is. So somebody with that, the ability to spot the gaps in logic, can still provide a valuable service on a team. But it's but the nature of it and kind of the attitude and all of that I think needs to needs to change in order to take that kind of role. And and. Anything else you want to say? Anything else I want to say? <laughs>